Good morning. I'm going to be presenting uh, the final report on our surface station project. I know a number of you have followed this through the years. It's a volunteer project where we had crowdsourcing, studying temperature stations around the United States in the uh, U.S. Cl uh, climatological, uh, historical climatological network, USHCN. And uh, we published a paper in 2010 which was inconclusive. Um, we thought that we found a sighting signal, but it was rather weak. And then in 2012, we came up with a new idea, and we published a draft paper on my website, which garnered a tremendous amount of criticism, probably because it was on the mark. Um, we took that criticism to heart, and we spent another two years redoing the work yet again. And today, I'm going to present to you the results of that two years' worth of work. Essentially, our conclusion from 2012 is unchanged. So here's what we did. A nationwide survey of the USHCN done by volunteers uh, based on sighting characteristic papers, Leroy 1999 and Leroy 2010, which defined the expected errors that we'd get on proximity to heat sources and heat sinks for these weather stations. and. Um, of note, Leroy 1999 was used to set up the U.S. Uh, Climate Reference Network, a state-of-the-art network with pristine siting, triple redundancy temperature sensors, and other state-of-the-art enhancements. And so if it's good enough for NOAA, we figured it was good enough for us to use for our first paper. Unfortunately, that particular siting uh, paper fell short because it only, it only brought into consideration distance. And what really is needed for categorizing heat sinks is distance plus area. So here's what we did. We decided we would try to find the best stations in the network. There's a network of 1,200 and, uh, 1200 and change stations. And uh, so we looked for the best stations that had a lack of station moves, a long period of record, no equipment changes, like going from MMTS to, or from CRS to MMTS or uh, CRS to ASOS, those kinds of things. Um, we looked for stations in particular that had no need for a change in the time of observation, and we were looking for the best stations that were in sighting classes one and two acceptable, which were close to the kind of sighting that was uh, in the U.S. Climate Reference Network. So here's a look at some of the stations we found. I know a lot of you have seen these before, but we have a lot of new people here at this conference, so I'm going to show some of them again. This station here in Marysville, California, is the one that really was the light bulb moment for me when I saw it. That uh, thing that looked like a, a beehive there, that thing on top of a pole, that is an MMTS. It's an electronic temperature sensor. It replaces the old Stevenson screen boxes. And it was essentially in a parking lot. Uh, and it was right next to these electronic units, those uh, boxes that you see there on the right on the second picture. Those are electronics uh, drop-in housing for the cell phone tower. Now, the city was renting out the cell phone tower area space and the fire station. And while I was standing there taking these photos right next to that sensor, I could feel warm air from the air conditioning blowing on me. And I thought to myself, in a parking lot next to air conditioners, and this is where we have a station that's measuring the climate of the United States, something's really seriously wrong. And so that was my light bulb moment. Here's some other stations. Here we have the traditional uh, Stevenson screen, or sometimes called the Cotton Region Shelter, next to the MMTS, right over Cinder and right next to parking at a bank. This one here at a water treatment plant is right next to a vent. Uh, that round thing that looked like a UFO, that's an air vent from an underground tank. And while, uh, the, uh, while the volunteer was there, during that interview, uh, he was told that, you know, the snow never sticks around this thing during the winter. <laughs> Gosh, <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> and this is why. The process of, of cleaning water, from making it, taking it from sewage to clean water, has a lot of heat involved in it. And this is an infrared photo I took standing on a highway overpass looking at a, uh, a water treatment, sewage treatment plant showing the difference. The ambient air temperature at that time was about freezing, 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees centigrade. 
the FLIR image shows that the water in the tanks was 13 degrees higher than that. So if you have stations that are next to wastewater treatment plants, you're going to get higher temperatures. And I want to back up just a second and explain why that might be. Why would anyone put a weather station at a water treatment plant? And it has to do with going way back to 1892 when the network was first put together, the Cooperative Observer Network, when the Weather Bureau was formed. It had to do with the fact that they had to have someone write down the readings seven days a week because it was done by mercury thermometers and a piece of paper. And so a lot of the places that they chose were places that were staffed seven days a week. And this would include fire stations, it would include ranger stations, police stations, other governmental agencies, and, and yes, sewage treatment plants because someone has to be there to manage that stuff every day of the week. Here's another sewage treatment plant, this one in Urbana, Ohio. You can see the temperature sensor there on the wall, right next to it, six inches away. And notice the note there that says refrigeration unit. The observer asks, why is that? What is that thing doing there? Well, it was because when workers are working on the equipment there, it gets so hot in that region, they need to have something to cool them down. This is where we measure temperature. Here's another one on the street in Perry, Oklahoma. It's got a west-facing wall, and at night, that wall radiates all of its infrared right at the thermometer. In fact, you can see how close it is to parking there because you can see a vehicle right next to the sensor in the uh, left-hand photo. This one is closed. It's uh, Baltimore, Maryland, right on top of a rooftop downtown on the Customs Building. It was closed because NOAA discovered that it was producing record high temperatures where no other stations were producing them. And this was a table that they produced to show that while it was producing on the rooftop there at the top, uh, excesses in 100 degrees, uh, other stations like BWI and uh, National Airport and surrounding co-op stations weren't producing these high temperature records. So they realized something was wrong, so they closed it. Here's another one, Wilbur, Washington, right next to an air conditioning unit. Here's my favorite one of all. This one is in the parking lot of the University of Arizona, Tucson. This is the weather station for the Atmospheric Sciences Department there. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And there's a story behind this. Why would anyone put... Oh, sorry. There we go. Thank you. Why would anyone put a weather station in a parking lot? It's, it's crazy, right? Well, it had to do with the way that the university works. The university was a land-grant university, and bits of land kept getting used. And so they kept having to move the weather station as new buildings or parking lots or whatever popped up. They ran out of places to put it, so they put it in the parking lot. Seriously. That was the, the rationale. After we exposed this, it got closed. It's now what we call a zombie weather station. Here's another one, Detroit Lakes, Minnesota, next to air conditioning units. Now, interesting story behind this one is they moved the Cotton Regions shelter, the wooden box, to that location because if you'll notice, there's lots of reeds to the left there. That is swampland. And the owner of the radio station was concerned because there was a mercury thermometer inside of that box that if that thermometer got broken and the mercury leached into the swamplands, he would have a hazmat situation and the EPA all over him. So he moved it. After we exposed this, they moved it back. <laughs> this one is the most ridiculous one of all. Can anyone identify what's underneath that cotton region shelter there? That, that is a gravestone. It's a gravestone underneath the temperature sensor box. And the story is that the reason they put it there is that when they went out, it didn't used to be there. The reason that they put it there was that when they went out to do the readings in the morning, sometimes it was dark in the winter, and they would stumble over the gravestone you know, on the way to the weather station. So they put the weather station on top of it. So what you've got is a heat sink there right underneath the weather station. This is where we measure temperature. This is an official USHCN station operated by NOAA. Our survey basically found that the vast majority of stations in the class 3, 4, and 5, which are considered unacceptable, are, make up about 90% of the network. It, it's really what these examples here are prevalent throughout the network. They're all over the place. And so about 10% of the stations are acceptable. And these are the ones we were looking for. 
And so after redoing our data again, after getting criticism in 2012, we made sure that we accounted for all issues, including things like the MMTS bias, uh, the, the smaller beehive units actually run a little bit cooler because they're a better shelter because they don't have to be painted, there's no maintenance issues. And so we found by region that the class one and two compliance stations have a land area weighted average, a gridded average of about 0.183 for the entire nation. That's the, the, the uh, decadal trend. The non-compliant stations, that other 90%, make up about 0.337 decadal trend, almost double. And after everything gets adjusted, NOAA adjusts some of them down, some of them up, you end up with a 0.321, that decadal trend. And that's the official reading that we get from NOAA. Again, almost double. The adjustments are basically a making a potpourri out of bad data and good data. And so you can see here that we have, uh, I'm using water bowls as an analogy that have uh, different amounts of, of mud in them. So if you've got bad stations and good stations and you mix all the water from these together, you end up making mud, literally, out of the temperature record. And that's what's been going on. There are so few good stations in the network that they're being swamped by the influence of infilling and homogenization of the bad stations. And so here's our final numbers in one concise chart. For all stations, as produced by NOAA, their adjusted value is 0.321. The value for the best stations are 0.183. We're very confident in this number. Basically, uh, it shows that for the United States, about half of the signal is due to poor stations, sightings, and adjustments. And so basically we end up with a situation where the true climate signal is that likely to be found in the best stations is getting swamped and the result is a false warming signal based mostly on sighting issues and no adjustments. NOAA doesn't see this, they've got a confirmation bias we believe and uh, basically the true climate signal is, is being hidden by this bias. And if this wasn't true, this signal that we found, why would NOAA need to have a perfect climate reference network? We believe the stations that we found are pretty close to that. So we believe that the sighting and the homogenization and the other adjustments contribute to the problem and that the um, United States temperature record is not fit for purpose. Thank you.